This conference will now be recorded. Hi, John. All right, so let's discuss cardiovascular emergencies. I guess we can see. There we go. All right. So let's get skip past all these educational competencies here. Let's get into the stuff you got to do. So let's talk about the introduction. Um, so really, with cardiovascular emergencies, which as I mentioned before, we cover respiratory and cardiac, and they kind of go hand in hand um, with that. And with that being said, um, we do deal a lot of a lot with acute coronary syndrome, acute MIs. Uh, to the CHF, you know, pulmonary edema, which is a respiratory issue um, because of the fluid, but really it's a cardiac issue that's causing a respiratory problem. Um, so there's a lot of different cardiovascular emergencies that are out there um, to include different rhythm changes and uh, arrhythmias, AFib, you know, things like that that can cause more clotting. Um, we'll get more into that in detail um, with the next presentation as well. So the American Heart Association estimates that one person has an acute myocardial infarction or an AMI in the United States approximately every 40 seconds. Every 40 seconds, someone's having a heart attack. So heart disease has been the leading cause of death in America since the early 1900s, and deaths from the cardiovascular disease can be reduced excuse me, with um, better public awareness. Uh, as a part of that, a public awareness stuff would be the, like the Heart Safe Community Projects. as well. Um, early access EMS, um, having staff stations versus volunteer. Uh, increased number of uh, lay people trained and willing to perform CPR. Um, and going into the, um, the hands-only stuff has really increased that. Um, the increased use of evolving technology and dispatch, um, emergency medical dispatching, giving directions over the phone uh, and the cardiac arrest response to public access to defibrillation devices. Uh, I mentioned in my last EMT class, the uh, town of Wolfboro, New Hampshire, excuse me, got a grant um, for 55 AEDs to put out throughout the community. All right, sorry about that. Um, and recognition for the need of advanced life support services. So communities actually bumping up their level to advanced level of care and also running tier systems and getting paramedics um, on board and in, in, in route to these calls on a tier response. Then transportation to hospitals that can provide coronary catheterization and post-arrest care. So having an idea of where the PCI centers are located um, and more PCI centers popping up. So for us, our closest PCI center in the areas that I work in, um, if I'm down and working in the mass area, I mean, there's PCI centers all over the place, but up here, our closest ones are like Dover, um, Portsmouth, Main Med, Concord, you know, CMC. Those are the bigger hospitals that have the PCI centers available. So if you're working in a smaller community that has a local critical access hospital, you may have to divert depending on your systems, um, therefore getting paramedics on board. But with all this kind of stuff happening and looking at the door to balloon times um, or the time of the call to the time to get the balloon done in the heart, in the artery, um, we're looking at that whole 90 minute mark. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So we are gonna do some anatomy review as well. Um, nothing too crazy. The cardiovascular, cardiovascular system consists of a heart, blood vessels, and blood. As you can see here, the heart being in the middle, the vessels deoxygenated blood, oxygenated blood, looking at the great vessels from the aorta, aortic arch, superior and inferior vena cava, um, and obviously the lungs and everything else down below. This is going to be pumping through. So remember, deoxygenated blood comes out through the alveoli and then exhale, exhaled out. Um, air comes in, breath comes in, 21% oxygen, nitrogen, all the other fun stuff with it. Uh, comes back in through and does that whole gas exchange within the lungs and the alveoli, then pumps it to the heart via the red blood cell. 
So having that understanding of how that works and how we can measure that, looking at perfusion status and oxygenation. Remember, we talked about pulse ox and um, internal CO2. So Justin, sorry, I just saw your message, Justin. 117 miles to yours. And which one is yours up there where you live? So Eastern Maine, Med, and Bangor. So yeah, um, and I'm sure you guys probably fly a lot of your STEMIs because of that, that distance. In my guess. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So again, um, just having that knowledge of where your systems are located and what they can do. Just keep in mind though, to kind of go back a slide, um, the one thing to add to local hospitals is they do have the ability um, to do heparin, TNK, Plavix, all those other medications that can help start that process of breaking down that clot and also opening the vessels um, before a scent goes in. I've seen patients get TNK and Plavix before and put on a heparin drip after a bolus, uh, after working in the ER, doing that kind of stuff, and then taking the transfer out later on. Um, I've seen patients that have had ST elevation MIs get better because of that, because the medicine is actually starting to work. So again, um, closest facility is not a bad thing, but if you have the ability to divert or bypass through a STEMI bypass system, then we need to do that as well. All right, so some of the structures of the heart would be the muscular, with the muscular part, which is the cone-shaped organ, whose function is to pump blood throughout the body. All right, the heart muscle, the muscle itself is referred to as the myocardium. Um, the pericardium or the pericardial sac is a thick fibrous membrane that surrounds the heart itself. And the visceral layer of the pericardium lies against the heart, which is called the epicardium. So we think about pericardium, right? The thick sac around that surrounds the heart. Or we can, that's it. We, when you have um, pressure up against it or fluid build up around it, you could have pericarditis, um, inflammation of the pericardium as well. Um, one of the tail signs of pericarditis would be um, ST elevation in all leads of your EKG if you do a 12, right? Or you can have the pericardial tamponade. Obviously, we know about that looking at Beck's triad um, when you have a patient having significant fluid around the heart, causing that to be able to pump effectively. Uh, the endocardium is a smooth liner or inner lining of the chambers of the heart and the surface of the valves. With that, each atrium uh, receives blood that is returned to the heart from other parts of the body, right? So blood's coming back in, pumping through the right atrium to the right ventricle, right through the valve, um, through the tricuspid valve down through. Then it pumps through the pulmonic valve going into the lungs, and that's where that gas exchange is happening. So remember that the right side of the heart's gonna have that deoxygenated blood it picks up oxygen to the left ventricle, sorry, left atrium, um, which pumps through the uh, mitral valve into the aortic valve, pumping through the left ventricle into the heart, or right into the body. Uh, so it's kind of the way the blood kind of flows through that process. So each atrium receives blood that is returned from the heart, remember, in other parts of the body, but each ventricle pumps blood out of the heart. And I just mentioned that the left ventricle um, is the strongest and the largest ventricle because it's responsible for pumping blood and, uh, through the blood vessels throughout the entire body. So if you check a radial pulse, carotid pulse, that beat you're feeling is your left ventricle depolarizing, um, which means expelling that energy, pushing that blood through the heart. Just checking the roster really quick. All right. So we have different uh, valves as well. Um, we have the tricuspid and mitral valve, um, aortic and pulmonic valve. Um, figure out different ways, remember those, but you need to understand where those valves are located. We'll cover that in the uh, next slide here. But we have the atrioventricular valves, the semilunar valves, um, the papillary muscles and the ventricles also contract to tighten the, the, the coordinate tendinae. Uh, so I'll show you guys this in the next slide here. Um, this kind of shows you the heart, including its valves itself. So remember, we have the right atria, right ventricle. So right atria here, right ventricle down here. This is the coordinate tendinae that helps with that pumping process. Uh, remember, this is all run through an electrical conduction system, uh, which we'll cover later on. But it pumps through 
the um, my goodness, having a moment through the tricuspid valve here as it pumps through the um, tricuspid first valve, right atria, right ventricle. Right ventricle then goes through the pulmonic valve into the lungs. Right, this is where the blood circulates here, deoxygenated blood. Right, as it goes through there, pumps through, we pick up red blood cells, new oxygen comes through to the right ventricle. Um, as we enter the right ventricle, we're going to go through the uh, mitral valve and then pump through the aortic valve, and then out we go, out into the system. So the coronary circulation, um, there's different arteries located within inside the heart. So the coronary arteries supply oxygen and nutrients to the heart. Remember that coronary circulation emanates from the left and right coronary artery, right? So the left main coronary artery divides into the left anterior descending artery and the circumflex coronary artery. Now, um, looking at 12 lead EKGs, if you look at a 12 lead and you see ST elevation, which would be an infarct of the, of the, um, would be an infarct, sorry, uh, infarct of a certain portion of the heart. So for example, if I said, um, patient has ST elevation and lead two, lead three, and lead AVF, I would know that that would be the inferior wall, which also includes the right coronary artery, um, where the blockage potentially could be. Uh, if I said um, one AVL, five and six, that would be the uh, high and low lateral walls of the heart, um, and, and that would be the left anterior descending artery. So you can kind of look at that kind of stuff um, when you look at the EKGs and say, huh, all right, now I know which wall is being affected and the artery that potentially could be occluded. I'll just by looking at a bunch of squiggly lines on a piece of paper. And I will show you guys more of that in the next presentation. Yeah, <laughs> so this slide here, um, if you can read it, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> it's very tiny on my screen here. But this kind of goes over the coronary arteries and supply oxygen and nutrients to the heart. So let's have more of an anterior view on the side A, and then you have the posterior view on the back side. And believe it or not, we can actually do um, posterior coverage on this as well, doing what they call a posterior EKG or an 18 lead. Uh, so that definitely helps out with that as well, if you have an understanding of how those work to be able to assist um, those medics. All right, stand by one second. Yeah, so the um, the vessels of the system, uh, the blood vessels, remember blood is transported through the body is through the body via arteries, right? The aorta is the largest supply. So think of the aorta being your major supply line, right? So for those firefighters in there, it's kind of like an LDH, okay? Your major supply line to the body. If you lose your LDH, what happens? I'll pick on some of the firefighters in the room. If you lose your, your large diameter hose, what happens? You lose your LDH, you're running off your tank water. You got no tank water. You're shit out of luck. Exactly. Exactly. Bad news bears, right? <laughs> lose supply. So think of your aorta being that major supply line. Your aorta, it has this, it's right around the same diameter as a quarter. Okay. So that's a pretty good size hose line going through your body. If you lose that, people can die, right? You lose your LDH, and then you're crap out of luck in the building, right? So you really can take the heart and turn it into a fire pump uh, and take a fire pump and understand how a heart works because it's the same thing. You got your arteries, your veins, your vessels, everything that's all there. It could be your, um, it's going to be your, your heart. Your heart is the fire pump itself. Your LDH is your major supply line. We just talked about that. The arteries branch into arterioles. So we talk about arteries being like a two and a half inch hose going into an inch, um, the arterioles, which would be like your inch and three quarter line going into your capillaries, which would be like your garden hose for fighting wildly in fire. That's pretty much how it works. It's the same same concept, um, which eventually um, enlarge to to form venules. And then we had that supply going back. So we get in, so we start in the aorta, supplies the body, goes into the arteries, which branch off into arterioles, which then go into the capillary bed where deoxygenated blood is taken away and oxygenated blood comes in. 
So then it goes back through the venules to the veins and back to the heart again, to the right atria, to the right ventricle, back to the lungs, where then it's pumped through and new oxygen is picked up. And that happens every time you feel a pulse, right? Another thing to remember as well with these vessels and looking at the, the vein side of stuff as it's being pumped back through the veins, arteries don't have um, valves built into them because it's built under pressure. <laughs> Jen, I saw your thing there. Is that like a mind blown thing? Or did I lose you? Right? Mind blown on the whole fire pump analogy? Oh, sorry. I'm going to slow down a little bit. I can do that. No, it's okay. I'll slow down a little bit here. So a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, there really is basic review as far as how the heart works. So remember that blood comes in. Um, okay. Blood comes in. We're just start from the beginning. Take a breath in. Oxygen comes into the lungs. Our red blood cells pick up that in the lungs, okay, to the alveoli. Red blood cells come through, picks it up, starts that whole transport into the left atrium, which then goes through the valve, mitral valve, into the left ventricle, which then pumps a very hard contraction to push that blood through the entire body. By going through that valve into the body itself, it starts in the arteries. Sorry, the, the um, my goodness, I said a moment. It starts in the aorta, which then pushes into the arteries of the body, which then goes into the arterioles, which means now we're getting smaller, right? Into the capillary bed, which is located on the top of our skin all over. Okay. As that's happening, our oxygenated blood carried by the red blood cells and, and the capillaries are now dumping off the good stuff and oxygen in the system and then picking up the bad stuff, carbon dioxide, right? Or the off gas of the, of the exchange, which then comes back through the veins being carried back through the venules to the veins, from the veins to the superior in, uh, inferior vena cava comes in, goes into the right atria, which then pumps through the tricuspid valve, which then goes into the left, sorry, right uh, ventricle, which then goes through the pulmonic valve back to the lungs and dumps off that carbon dioxide. Does that make sense now, Jen? I know it's a lot to take in. Um, so you wish there was a picture. Hold on if you wait one second here. There you go. <laughs> I should have just gone to the next slide for you. But here's a picture here of how the blood vessels actually work. So the blood flow through the heart in figure A the flow of oxygen toward blood from the venous circulation. And then figure B is flow of oxygen rich blood from the pulmonary veins through the left side of the heart into the aorta itself. So if you look at that picture, Jen, that might help you out a little bit better by following the different lines and arrows. So as you can see, all the bad stuff's coming in. So you have the superior and inferior vena cava, okay? So that's the, um, so it's coming out, coming into the heart. Right and left ventral, so this is, this is the right atria here. Okay, pump through the mitral, um, sorry, tricuspid valve. The coordinate tendon A is located here. That's the tendon for the heart, right? Deoxygenated blood is still currently here, right? And then pumps again through the pulmonic valve, which is these little flaps here. This goes into the lungs, as you can see here, pulmonary, left pulmonary artery, blood to the lung, left lung. This one here goes to the right lung over here. So it kind of splits and goes around, right? As that's happening, now we have um, oxygen coming in, right? So we take a breath in, right? Oxygen-rich blood comes through, comes through the um, into the lungs and the capillary, I'm sorry, the, vet, the arterioles, my goodness. Um, and then it's pumped through the right, sorry, left, excuse myself here now, the left atrium, which is here, into the left ventricle, Left ventricle is the big pump. That's your heartbeat. So if you feel your pulse right now, all right, every beat you feel is that left ventricle contracting, or they call depolarizing. And what happens here is then it pumps through oxygen-rich blood to the head and upper body, 
that goes up here and then down through the oxford squad to lower body area order located down here and that is your main supply line that pumps everything it takes all that blood through the entire system to the capillary bed right so major supply aorta to the arteries to the arterioles to the capillaries then from the capillaries to the venules to the veins back to the heart is that better a little better maybe <clears throat> All right. Any other questions on that at all? I know it's a lot to take in. I'm not seeing or hearing anything. All right. Got it. I'm good. Perfect. All right. Good, good. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little about talk a little bit about blood components. So the blood components we have are plasma, which are formed elements or, or cells, um, red blood cells, RBCs, white blood cells, WBCs, and platelets. The red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which binds to oxygen and carries it to the tissues. White blood cells are otherwise known as leukocytes fight infection platelets play an important role in blood clotting process so if you happen to get a call for someone who has abnormal labs and they say that their white count is elevated that means that the patient has an infection all right we look for anything over like 10 to 11. 10 is usually the number we look for anything um, greater than 10 would be considered a patient has a light, slight infection as it moves up. Or they can have a white count of like two. And what would that mean? Is a white count of two good? No. Because at this point in time, they're immunocompromised. So what patients would you suspect to have a low white count? Cancer patients. Yep, cancer patients, exactly. So again, cause and effect, everything that we do has an effect to it, or if we find something that has something going on, it's all part of it. I don't understand you know, what potential is going inside the body through the pathophysiology behind it, because Patients that have cancer and are receiving uh, chemo have low white counts, if anything at all, and they're very immunocompromised, which means that they can pick up an infection or something that our normal body could fight off could kill them, right? So make sure you're wearing the appropriate PPE. So the electrical conduction system um, is the pumping of the heart that occurs in response to an electrical stimuli or stimulus initiated by a conduction system, all right? So the things you guys need to know are the intrinsic rates behind this and why this is happening. So the first one, and I'll show you guys a picture in the next slide, all right, is called the sinoatrial node or the SA node, all right? The SA node is, um, is the normal site of origin of the electrical impulse. Each one of these has an intrinsic rate. So the intrinsic rate for the SA node is 60 to 100 beats per minute. 60 to 100. Then you go down to the next one, which is called the atrioventricular node or AV node, right? Which this may take over if the SA node is not functioning properly. And the intrinsic rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute, right? The impulse is then spread out through the rest of the conduction system, resulting in ventricular contraction or systole. Okay. Now there is more to this than just what we just talked about. All right, so as you're looking through here, these are our, our pacemakers. You guys see the yellow lines in here? Yes, okay. So here's your SA node, your intrinsic rate being 60 to 100 beats per minute. Um, as it fires and then takes electricity through these little yellow lines here, these are called internodal pathways. Okay, it's not listed on here. Those are called internodal pathways which then go to the atrioventricular node, 
remember that the intrinsic rate is 40 to 60. Okay, this is this is slower rates. Okay, so the SA node's firing, 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 firing all this through the internodal pathway. Go to the SA node. Did you send it by email, Mike? Through text. Hey, look at that. Yeah, I'll forward that over to Jen right now, really quick. See by. Actually, let me see if I can do this. This could help too. So I just sent it to everybody's email. Everybody should have it. Thanks, Mike, for sending that. I sent that in a mass email of the video. Hopefully it works. All right. So back to the heart. Um, so as it comes through, it goes to the atrioventricular bundle, or what they call the bundle of his, which is located here. What that does is it slows down the impulse a little bit more, so it can fire right. This thing's firing so quickly, it kind of takes all that energy and then disperses it through here. Each yellow line, one going this side and one going to the other side over here, this is what they call the right and left bundle branches. So for those of you who have ever heard of a bundle branch block, these are right and left bundle branches here, which then circles around, which stimulates the ventricle. These are called the Purkinje fibers. That too has an intrinsic rate as well, which was not mentioned in the system. And the intrinsic rate is 15 to 30 beats per minute. If that's firing, our patient's in a major block of some sort. Right, nothing that we're going to be able to figure out, fix um, at the advanced EMT level. All right, so the electrical properties of cardiac cells, the excitability, which is the ability of the cells to respond to electrical impulses, then you have conductivity, which is the ability of cells to conduct electrical impulses, and we have the automaticity, which is the ability to contract without a stimulus from a nerve source. So we have excitability, conductivity, automaticity. Those are the definitions for all those. All right, Jeff, see you later. All right, so the regulation of the heart function. The heart has chronotropic, dromotropic, and inotropic states, right, which are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, hormones, and the endocrine system. Of the endocrine system and the heart tissue itself and we also have receptors which are in the blood vessels like the kidneys the brain and the heart which constantly which constantly monitor the body's function to maintain sorry to maintain homeostasis that's what our receptors are for baroreceptors respond to change in pressure which usually within the heart or the main arteries. Chemoreceptors sense change in the uh, in the chemical composition of the blood. So this is how our heart is regulated, based on receptors, baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and then the heart's chronotropic, dermatropic, and autotropic states that help with the autonomic nervous system. So all this stuff plays in that regulation to make sure the heart is pumping effectively. We're uh, regulating appropriately. We're excreting appropriately uh, to make so that we can meet homeostasis within the body. If we have a deviation in any of this stuff here, our patients start becoming sick. And it could be heart failure to AFib to any one of the number of things we're going to cover here in a few minutes. All right. So the cardiac cycle begins with a myocardial contraction and concludes at the beginning of the next contraction. Systole is contraction of the ventricles and pumping of blood into the systemic circulation, so in motion, movement. Diastole, or diastolic pressure, is the relaxation of the heart. Okay, so what's a normal blood pressure?
120 over 80. Yeah, 120 over 80, 110 over 70, depending on what book you read, right? That's a good blood pressure because we have we know that at in motion, okay, it's really 120 for pressure, and at rest it's 80. If we have a patient who has a blood pressure of 260 over 120, right, that's bad. We know that's hypertensive, right? Which means that our pressure against the walls under pressure is 280, and our pressure is at rest or is our 120. Therefore, our vessels aren't getting it a break. So what are you more susceptible to be having if, if your patient has a blood pressure that high? Give me three things that could happen. Name three. Stroke is one. Okay. Give me two more. Heart attack and there's one more. We have the yeah. heart attack, stroke. Yeah. Sing it. I'm hearing some stuff. <laughs> Here we're to blow out. Um Triple A T um the other one would be like congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. So a lot of patients you have that have significant pulmonary edema usually are very, very hypertensive, which is why CPAP works so well, because it decreases the blood pressure and on top of that pushing the fluid out of the lungs, along with giving nitrates. Oh, we need to drop that so fast. Good job. So the cardiac cycle also has some other things as well. One is preload which is the amount of blood returned to the heart to be pumped out and directly affects afterload. Afterload is the pressure in the aorta or the peripheral vascular resistance against which the left ventricle must pump blood. All right, so we have preload and afterload. Patients having an inferior wall MI, leads 2-3 AVF, may have right-sided heart involvement. If that happens, it's not a um, afterload issue, it's a preload issue. Therefore, they don't have enough fluid to pump in effectively, which means they actually need fluids and not nitrates. Whereas if someone that's having an afterload issue or a blockage, that may resolve nitrates, the patient will actually be more hypertensive. So stroke volume is the amount of blood injected per contraction. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped through the circulatory system in one minute, expressed with equation. Cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So other factors that influence the heart rate, stroke volume, or both will affect cardiac output and perfusion. Right? <clears throat> So Starling's law of the heart is increased venous return to the heart stretches the ventricles to some extent, resulting in increased cardiac contractility. The ejection fraction is a percentage of blood pumped from the heart with each contraction. Our ejection fraction should be 70 or above, okay? When we start losing more of the ejection fraction, it means our heart is no longer pumping effectively. Patients that have MIs have lower ejection fractions. So if you do an interfacility transfer, they say, oh, the EF is 40%. That means that his heart is not pumping effectively at all. I've taken patients that have had an EF of 10%. That means they pretty much have no cardiac movement at all. all right? These patients here are in heart failure, usually full heart failure itself. Exactly, transplant. That's going to be the next step, all right? So when you're transporting patients, especially in a facility, but if you're also doing 911 calls, they say, well, my EF is 30%. Just understand, this guy, can, his heart is not pumping effectively, all right? Remember, that's a percentage of blood pumped from each heart. Let me phrase that. Pump from the heart with each contraction, all right? We don't have more than one heart. <laughs> all right, so blood flow within the heart. So the blood um, from the upper part of the body returns to the heart through the superior vena cava. Blood from the lower part of the heart returns from the inferior vena cava. Remember, superior, inferior, top and bottom. In the lungs, blood is oxygenated and carbon dioxide and other waste products are removed through exhalation. Oxygenated blood is then returned to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, 
and the oxygenated blood is returned to the heart via the veins itself, right? So there's only one set of veins that carry oxygenated blood in the entire body, and that is your pulmonary vein, right? Which I'm sure you will see on a test question. Pulmonary circulation uh, carries blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs and back to the left side of the heart. Systemic circulation is responsible for blood flow to the rest of the body, right? That's our left ventricle firing down the aorta, through the arteries, arterioles, into the capillaries body-wide, right? Systemic atrial um, circulation is oxygenated blood that leaves the heart through the aortic valve and passes into the aorta. From the aorta, blood is then distributed to all parts of the body at this point. So you have to have good systemic atrial circulation, right? So what are some things that can inhibit good circulation on the extremities, not just the heart itself? Exactly, diabetes, right? So if a patient, you know, let's throw this out there, smokers, diabetes, black buildup, uh, Old Orchard Beach, pure fries, yeah, all that stuff, right? So we talk about all these different things, right? If a patient has neuropathy, okay, or a lack of circulation, therefore it becomes numb, right? Could they have atypical signs of chest pain or an MI? I'm seeing yes, yes, yes. Where would we most likely see issues? Would it be the typical chest pain? No. So where, where else might you have pain, especially in diabetics? I see back pain. What else? Right? As extremities, right? Arms and legs. Yeah, you could have numbness and tingling. Yeah. What's another big one? Let's go down a little bit lower. Go down lower, lower, lower. Not too low, though. Above the pelvis, below the lungs. <laughs> abdominal pain, right? Abdomen. So patients that have abdominal pain require a 12 lead every single time because it also is an atypical sign, but yet females have atypical signs. Diabetics have atypical signs. Upper upper gastric pain is one of the biggest ones, right? These are all things we want to do 12 leads on to rule out an MI, right? So again, just because they don't have chest pain does not mean they're not having a heart attack. So check it. They could also have shortness of breath causing the MI as well, secondary to, or should I say secondary to an MI when the patient's currently pain-free. So again, 12 leads are very important in getting our patients because that gives us that bigger picture uh, to be able to see what's going on. I'll describe that more in the next slide. Our next presentation. So cardiac cell ischemia. Um, or chest pain or discomfort that is related to heart to the heart usually stems from the cardiac cell ischemia ischemia. So decreased blood flow to heart muscles. Heart tissue fails to get enough oxygen and nutrients, then tissue then soon begins to starve and eventually dies. if blood flow is not restored. Those are our vessels within the system, right? Our arteries, left interior descending, circumflex, right, um, right coronary artery, all those different arteries that are located within the heart, right? If they're not getting blood flow, cardiac muscle dies, right? What different muscle groups do we have in the system, in our body? We have three, three of them, right? What are they? Yeah, smooth muscle. What else? Cardiac muscle. And there's one more. Smooth, cardiac. There's one more. You guys are saying voluntary stuff, but there's one more group. The last one would be skeletal. Yep, Matt O'Connor got it. Skeletal. Interesting thing though, skeletal muscle and smooth muscle can rejuvenate and, and heal. 
cardiac muscle, once it's dead, it stays dead. So that term, time is muscle, is very important. Time is muscle. Getting that heart oxygenated, right? You can give all the oxygen in the world to a patient through a nasal cannula on a breather. If there's 100% occlusion, there is no oxygen getting to that side of the heart. The only way to fix it is getting a cardiac catheterization done at a PCI center and going in doing a cath, whether it be femoral or radial, doesn't matter where they go in, but getting that cath done. Or if it's a multi-vessel, then they get what they call a cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass graft, where they go in and they move vessels and they, and they bypass vessels to restore blood flow to the heart. All right, so there's different factors behind all this. That's why it's so important to make sure these patients get to a hospital. So arterial sclerosis is diminishes blood flow to the myocardium. I'll show you guys this in the next slide. Uh, cholesterol and other fatty substances build up and form a plaque inside the walls of the blood vessels. Right, arterial sclerosis, is, which is thickening of the arterial walls, which causes hardening of the arteries, which then can reduce blood flow. Okay. All of us probably have some form of plaque buildup somewhere in our system. We've eaten bad foods in the past, okay? Question is, how much have you had? Um, it's also hereditary, dietary. There's a lot of different things that can change a lot of this stuff too. Um, but again, french fries, cheeseburgers, fatty foods, all this kind of stuff that builds up the plaque. It's there. This can cause a complete occlusion or blockage. This right here, as you see, is a normal artery. Right. And here we have abnormal blood flow because we have plaque buildup on the walls, as you can see here. OK, so why do we give aspirin? What is the purpose behind aspirin? To make the blood slippery. Right. Prevents further clotting and forming. Don't stick. Making blood slippery. Makes platelets less sticky. That way there, when the platelets are coming through, they don't start attaching to the plaque of the walls and everything else under here, causing a patient's um, a patient to fully occlude, okay? So patients that have chest pain in these vessels that we're seeing here on the screen, right? We need to do something to make this bigger. And what can we do to make that happen? What medication do we carry to make them bigger? Nitro. Remember that nitro's classification is a nitrate used as a vasodilator. The mechanism of action is to vasodilate. By doing so, we can open this up, allowing for more blood flow to pass through, therefore in turn, hopefully oxygenating that myocardium, as long as it's not 100% occlusion. Right? Are things starting to come together a little bit better now? For some of you? Okay, awesome. It all plays a part. So a thromboembolism is a blood clot that gets stuck in a narrow area blocking blood flow, as you can see in the photo. All right. We don't want that to continue clotting, so we give aspirin. A myocardial infarction or a acute myocardial infarction is a blockage in the artery, in the coronary artery, which is your classic heart attack. Now, if you have a blocked artery, as you can see the darkening over here, this is damaged heart muscle, okay? Once that infarcts, you can no longer rejuvenate that. It, it dies. So getting this clot removed or putting in a stent to allow more blood flow will help fix what's currently here if it's not already dead. Major factors are high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetes, elevated blood glucose levels, lack of exercise, stress, and then elevated cholesterol levels as well. Major uncontrollable risk factors are old age or older age, family history of CAD, race, ethnicity, and the male sex. So acute coronary syndrome, which is what we're being dispatched to for ACS stuff, Describes any group of symptoms consistent with an acute myocardial ischemia. Myocardial ischemia is decreased in blood flow to the heart 
which is, which can result in angina pectoris or an acute MI. This is treated similarly under the diet designation of ACS. So patients that have ST depression or ST excitement depression means that your heart is ischemic in that area and still have, may have a fighting chance if we can vasodilate, hopefully, if it's in the right part of the heart, they can receive nitro and allow that vessel to receive oxygen. However, that ischemia, the clock continues and blocks it completely, it'll change from elevate depression to elevation. Angina pectoris uh, is a brief period of when the heart tissues are not getting enough oxygen. Oh my God, you call for the chest pain, right? They may have crushing, squeezing, felt in the mid chest under the sternum, can radiate to the jaw, the arms and the mid back, or the epigastrum. This disappears with rest, oxygen, or nitro, right? Now, with that being said, a patient that has angina pectoris and they're taking nitro with no relief, right, or with rest or with oxygen, that becomes unstable angina, okay? Without a predictable frequency, it just starts to, it doesn't get, it doesn't get any better or progressive angina that doesn't get better with rest or nitrates. So a single episode may come before myocardial infarction. So stable angina occurs at a relatively predictable frequency. So they do something, develop some chest pain, sit down, it goes away. It's predictable angina pectoris. Something sends you home with some nitro, your primary care, you can pop it when you need it. But it can get progressively worse over time. And if there's a blockage, that's where we're going to start seeing more of the unstable angina and or going into an MI. That's why it's so important, so important that when you get on scene, and it's also protocol for New Hampshire and Maine, is that you obtain a 12 lead EKG, even at the basic level, if you have a 12 lead available, okay, to obtain this within the first 10 minutes of patient contact. So please, please, please bring the cardiac monitor into the home with you, right? Bring it inside, because that's gonna be very um, beneficial to get that initial EKG before we start moving the patient around or giving them more medicine. And if you, as an AEMT with 12 lead capabilities, if you do happen to give nitro, right? Five minutes after the nitro, please repeat the EKG 12 lead to see if there's been any changes. All right, so signs and symptoms, sudden onset of weakness, nausea, and sweating without any obvious cause, chest pain, discomfort, or pressure that is often crushing or squeezing, and that does not change with each breath. Pain, discomfort, or pressure in the lower jaw, arms, back, abdomen, or neck. Irregular heartbeat or syncope, like fainting. Shortness of breath or dyspnea. Pink frothy sputum, which would indicate possible for pulmonary edema or sudden death. So the most common symptom is chest pain, right? The pain of an AMI differs from the pain of angina in three different ways. One, can occur at any time. Two, does not resolve in a few minutes. It can last between 30 minutes and several hours. Or three, may or may not be relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. The pain felt just beneath the sternum uh, and is variously described as heavy, squeezing, crushing, or tight. So you want to ask that patient that question. Do you have any chest pain? Yes, but what does it feel like? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Right? Does it feel like something's sitting on you, an elephant sitting on your chest? Is your heart, is your feel like your heart's being squeezed? Right? And that's where that whole Levine sign thing comes in place, right? We talk about Levine sign. If they're squeezing their chest or their hand, normally it's indic indicative of an acute MI versus an open hand over the chest, which is usually indicative of um, a non MI or maybe something more acute with muscle issues and things like that. 
Um, the patient um, sometimes feels frightened. The pulse increase has normal response to pain, stress, fear, or an injury to the myocardium. The blood pressure may fall due to diminished cardiac output, right? Uh, difficulty breathing is also very common with this as well. And the overwhelming feeling of impending doom, where the patient's going to say to you, I feel like I am going to die. Some consequences with this would be sudden death, usually a result of cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, heart failure. Some other lethal or non-lethal dysrhythmias may follow an MI, like PVCs or premature ventricular contractions, tachycardia, bradycardia, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and systole. So looking at the next slide here, here are some rhythm strips. So what you're seeing here um, in the upper, let's we'll start in the upper left-hand corner and work our way over from left to right, right? This one here, what you're seeing is what they call a sinus tachycardia. There's a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave. We will go over this in the next presentation, right? This one here is sinus bradycardia. It's slower, okay? Less than 60 is bradycardia. Less, greater than 100 is tachycardia. The next slide down here is what they call a ventricular tachycardia. So it's fast and it's wide complex. The complex goes from here on the QRS wave over. It's greater than 0.12 millimeters across, right, or boxes. What you're seeing here is ventricular fibrillation of the heart and VFib. Basically, it's quivering. And the one down below is called a systole. A systole is completely a flat line with no electrical activity at all. Like I said, on the next presentation, I have more of this up for you guys to go over. So cardiogenic shock is often caused by the myocardial infra inf uh, infarction, which the heart lacks enough power to force the proper volume of blood through the circulatory system, right? Differentiated from hypovolemic shock, by a chief complaint, so chest pain, dyspnea, tachycardia, heart rate being bradycardic or excessive tachycardia, peripheral edema, dysrhythmias, jugular vein distension, and crackles or rails on auscultation of breath sounds. The patients that are in cardiogenic shock require a paramedic because they're gonna give a vasopressor to these patients to help boost up their heart rate and pressures. The same initial evaluation and treatment as a patient reporting chest pain, signs and symptoms would be anxiety or restlessness, air hunger, pale clammy skin, high pulse rate, rapid and shallow breathing, nausea and vomiting, and a decrease in body temperature and hypotension. So the, um, the treatment for this would be putting a patient in position of comfort, maintain oxygen saturations of greater than 94 but less than 99, assist ventilations as necessary, preserve body heat, keep them warm, gain IV access, transport the patient, and call for paramedic backup if they're available. All right. Heart failure is the ventricular myocardium, which can no longer keep up with the return of blood flow from the aorta. This can occur any time after an MI, heart valve damage, or long-standing high blood pressure. Usually happens between the first few hours or the first day, few days after an MI, where they'll start developing heart failure and developing um, cardiac pulmonary edema or extremity edema. Left-sided heart failure, where you would see a patient with um, acute pulmonary edema, is where the pumping function of the left ventricle can be damaged by coronary artery disease, disease heart valves, or chronic hypertension. 
where the heart rate increases, the left ventricle enlarges to increase the amount of blood pumped each minute, right? So as the ventricle, left ventricle enlarges, that starts a cardiomyopathy, right? Which then in their turn makes it almost like a floppy heart. Congestive heart failure, lungs become congested with fluid, right? And the heart fails to pump the blood effectively. So go back to the cardiomyopathy. Um, eventually, this can lead to complete heart failure to the point where the ejection fraction is very low, right? Because now the, the left ventricle is floppy and not able to contract or constrict to be able to pump the blood based on the depolarization. Right-sided heart failure is where fluid collects in the body, often showing up as swelling in the feet and legs. So they have dependent edema or pedal edema. So if you see that, the patient's most likely in heart failure, a lot of times they're on medications like Lasix, furosemide, uh, torsemide, hydrochlorothiazide, medications like that that would help reduce the amount of fluid in the system. Orthopenia, signs and symptoms. Orthopenia, um, patient becoming agitated, chest pain, descended neck veins, swollen ankles, pedal edema, hypertension, tachycardia, tachypnea, use of accessory breathing muscles, crackles, productive cough, and delayed capillary refill time. Our treatment is going to be obtain vital signs, monitor the heart rate, administer oxygen as needed. A lot of patients remain still. Uh, in an upright position and legs down, IV access, be reassuring, bring a patient's meds with you, administer nitroglycerin if systolic blood pressure is above 100, and transport. What they don't talk about in this one here is CPAP. This is a CPAP patient, right? Patients require positive and expiratory pressure and continuous positive airway pressure to push that fluid out of the lungs in conjunction with nitro, as long as the pressures are within reason. So some common complications of myocardial ischemia that may or may not be the result of an MI, pulmonary edema, um, also can result in acute respiratory failure and death, which we already talked about, the pulmonary edema stuff. Um, precipitating causes of heart failure, MI, pulmonary embolus, hypertension, and a cardiomegaly. Preload and afterload influence are the buildup of pulmonary edema, which is why we gotta be careful when we're giving somebody too many fluids that already has heart failure issues. That's why we reassess lung sounds after every, how many, amount, what's our amount of fluid we give before we reassess lung sounds? What's our magic number? Yep, perfect, 250. Good job. All right. So the hypertensive emergency. We do not really have a hypertensive protocol. All right. This occurs when the systolic blood pressure is greater than 180. A rapid increase in systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure of 120 or greater. Symptoms are related to the effects of the hypertension. Like sudden severe headache is very common. Uh, position the patient with the head elevated, transport rapidly, and establish IV access in case they go into cardiac arrest or have a stroke with airway compromise or whatnot. Monitor the blood pressure regularly, so set these blood pressure auto BP cuffs for five minutes. Consider them an unstable patient. So they ordered dissecting aneurysm. An aortic aneurysm is a weakness in the wall of the aorta. A dissecting aneurysm occurs when the inner layers of the aorta become separated, allowing blood to flow between the layers. That's bad, right? We don't want that to happen. Uncontrolled hypertension for this is the primary cause, right? There's nothing we're going to do in the field for this, nothing at all. Give this patient to an OR, right? Signs and symptoms, sudden chest pain in, in an interior chest or back between the shoulder blades. So the pain will usually come on full force with one from one minute to the next. So consider any patient with a sub substantial hypertension to have a potential for an aortic dissecting aneurysm. All right, so before we get into patient assessment, it's seven o'clock. 
let's take 10 minutes and come back at 7.10, then we'll continue on from there. This conference will now be recorded. All right, so let's talk about patient assessment. All right, so as you looked at your medical assessment sheets, you notice that there's different categories we're going to be tested in. Respiratory, cardiac, GI, obstetrics, and all the different ones that are there. Let's tailor the assessment for the cardiac patient there. So perform a thorough assessment. Recognize a sense of urgency for reperfusion when the patient receives no relief with medications or presents with hypotension or signs of hypoperfusion or shock. So throughout the call, provide emotional support for the patient and an explanation for the family or significant others of what's going on. Scene size up. <clears throat> um, ensure scene safety. Look for and address any hazards, determine the number of patients that need for additional resources, identify the nature of illness, and do not become fixated on a specific condition. Because again, it could be something um, completely different than what we were actually called for. Right? So don't fixate yourself on one specific issue. Form a general impression of the patient's condition to recognize and address any like threats, sick or not sick. Perform a full body scan, rapid trauma assessment. If the patient is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive, find AED, start CPR. Assess for any major bleeding or substantial edema in dependent areas, so lower extremities. Assess airway breathing. Consider the use of CPAP. If you think you need it, you probably do, right? Don't second guess yourself. Apply it to patients that need it. Assess circulation and make a transport decision based on whether life threats were stabilized. Okay, run away, dog. I got somebody unmuted. All right, we're back. Let's keep going. All right. So as far as history taking goes, determine and investigate the chief complaint and history of the present illness. What's going on? Why are we here today? What made you call 911? I'm having chest pain. Now we have a chief complaint, what the patient tells us. Not all patients experience an AMI, though, have the same symptoms, signs, and symptoms. We already talked about that before. A hypergastric, abdominal, back, shoulders, neck, and whatnot. So a chief complaint of chest pain or discomfort, shortness of breath, or dizziness should be taken seriously. Abdominal pain, taken seriously. Determine if the patient is experiencing chest pain or discomfort and if the patient is having respiratory difficulty. Remember, they go hand in hand, respiratory and cardiac. Ask about other signs and symptoms. What else is going on? Do you have any shortness of breath, any abdominal pain? Are you dizzy, nausea? Obtain a sample history, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, pertinent past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to what's going on. Ask about the patient's allergies. Determine whether they are prescribed. Um, over-the-counter or herbal medications. Find out what condition they are taking for. They are taken for. So if they say they're on lisinopril, if you don't know it, ask them. What are you on lisinopril for? Oh, my hyper, my, my blood pressure is high. Okay. And a lot of times they'll say, "Do you have a history of hypertension?" No. Um, are you on? Do you take metoprolol? Yes. Did you take it for hypertension? Yes. Okay, you have a history of hypertension. A lot of times you need to explain yourself to them to have an understanding.
let's see. Um, let's try to thought for a minute. So, determine if they are if they are if there is any recreational drug use as well. A lot of times that can also cause cardiac events. Include the OPQRSTI questions. Remember onset, provocation, palpitation. Uh, quality, radiation, region, severity, timing, and the interventions that were done prior to our arrival, right? Did they take any aspirin or nitro? Then ask specific questions um, to, the cardi the, to the cardiovascular emergency. Have you ever had a heart attack before? Does it feel like your last heart attack if, 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 you, if you ever had one before? Have you ever been told that you have heart problems? Have you ever been diagnosed with angina, heart failure, or heart valve disease? Have you ever had high blood pressure? Have you ever been diagnosed with an aneurysm? Do you have any respiratory diseases such as emphysema or chronic bronchitis? Do you have diabetes? Have you ever had a problem with your blood sugar? Have you ever had any kidney issues or kidney disease? Do you have any risk factors for coronary artery disease, such as smoking, high blood pressure, or stress? High stress lifestyle. Is there anyone in your any family history of it? Do you currently take any medications? These are all specific questions that are tailored to the ACS algorithm. What we're going to be doing for a patient that has chest pain. So, Mike, you're saying layman's terms as in far as when we ask the questions. To the patient. Correct. Yes, exactly. Um, that's a good point to bring up. I am teaching you guys to speak medical terminology, but to the lay person, they don't know what a lot of this stuff means. Right. So you want to bring things down to their level, um, which makes things a little bit easier for you to be able to get that information out, um, out of them. I've always told people in all my classes, we don't just gather information, we don't interview, we interrogate. Keep it simple, exactly. I like interrogation better than I like interview. Because really what we're doing is we're interrogating, interrogating them to get the information that we need to be able to provide a differential diagnosis and come up with a treatment plan. So we have to interrogate. The secondary assessment, um, evaluate the patient's circulation, assess for signs of inadequate ventilation, reassess the level of consciousness because things can change, especially if they're more ischemic, they can, they can become altered. Um, obtain the blood pressure readings in both arms to compare for stroke or aortic aneurysm because one will be higher than the other. Uh, repeat vital signs at appropriate intervals, five or 15 minutes depending on stability. Then we do our reassessment afterwards. We'll repeat the primary survey, provide prompt transport to the closest appropriate facility, and report to the hospital or radio or cell phone while en route to the, route to the hospital. We're going to document assessment of the patient, the patient's response to interventions, and the time of each intervention in our report. And make sure you also remember to document that reassessment. It's very important after you give a med, reassess the patient and see if it had any change, good or bad. You have to document either one. So emergency medical care for chest pain or discomfort. The treatment begins with proper positioning. Patients who do not tolerate being positioned supine should be allowed to sit up, leaning, leaning their back on the stretcher. A lot of times that will make them feel better, sitting them up. Provide oxygen as needed to maintain SpO2 of 94% or higher. Remember to stay away from that 100% number. Provide assistance with breathing if needed. Obtain a 12 lead EKG within the first 10 minutes of patient contact. Gaining IV access, but do not delay transport. Right? Try to get it en route. All right? Now, if you need to get access on scene, if it's something that's like going to be a hard stick, then make an attempt and then start transporting. Forget patient access. Depending on local protocol, prepare to administer aspirin and, lift and assist with a prescribed nitroglycerin. 
Now, at the advanced EMT level, Maine, New Hampshire, right, you have the ability to give nitro standing order. Does that have to be the patient's own? Right, nitroglycerin relieves pain of angina by increasing the size of the vessels to increase oxygenation to the hypoxic tissue. This relaxes the muscle of the blood, wall, blood vessel walls, dilates coronary arteries, increases blood flow, and the supply of oxygen to the heart muscle and decreases the workload of the heart. This also dilates blood vessels in other parts of the body. So this can sometimes cause low blood pressure or a severe headache. Right. Other side effects include changes in the patient's pulse rate, including tachycardia or bradycardia. So what happens if you have a patient that's showing positive signs on the Cincinnati stroke scale and are complaining of chest pain? Do we give them nitro? No. But the protocol says acute coronary syndrome, give nitro, right? This is where being a clinician comes into play. Just because the protocol says to do something does not mean it's right for that patient presentation, right? Exactly. Treat the patient, not the book. Use your clinical judgment, okay? Can you give aspirin? Absolutely. Just don't give nitro to patients that have positive signs of a stroke. Or even if you suspect it. Right, patient could have significant head pain in one specific spot, but have chest pain. It could be a hemorrhagic bleed, and if you vasodilate, you're going to make that bleed even worse. Which part for the aspirin or the nitro? Yeah, please don't give nitro to those. All right. Bad things can happen. But um, if all else fails, medical consultation. So administering nitro, we want to make sure that we check the condition and expiration date of the medication. Please wear gloves while handling nitro. Obtain permission from the medical control or to administer. Again, this is national registry. So again, if you were taking your exam, your national exam, they may uh, ask you to contact med control for patient prescribed, but state protocol allows us to administer um, non-patient prescribed. And then skill drill 18.1 in your book, this will list the steps to administer nitro. All right, so let's talk about some heart surgeries and cardio cardiac assistive devices, like LVADs and things like that or ventricular assist devices in general. So heart surgeries and cardiac assisted devices have open heart procedures which are performed to bypass damaged segments of the coronary artery. Look at the cardiac scar down in the middle of this person's chest. All right, these are more like your cabbages, your coronary artery bypass graft, C-A-B-G, right? Which is a blood vessel from the chest or leg that is sewn directly from the aorta to the coronary artery beyond the point of its obstruction. These are ones that can no longer be fixed. They have to, they have to put, put a bypass inside instead. Um, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty dilates the coronary arteries. So chest pain in a patient who has undergone any of these procedures should be treated the same as chest pain in patients who have not undergone any heart surgery. It's all the same, treat them the same way. Right, pacemakers, which are inserted with an electrical conduction system of the heart, which cannot function properly. These deliver an electrical impulse through wires that are in direct contact with the myocardium. The pacemaker does not function properly. The patient may experience syncope, dizziness, and weakness. A patient with a malfunctioning pacer should be transported promptly to the hospital. There are two different types, well, three different types of pacemakers that are out there, okay? They're either gonna be demand, on-demand or continuous pacing. They can be atrial in nature, ventricular in nature, or they call a dual chamber, which has atrial and ventricular 
pacing, right? So it could be one, the other, or both, and they could either be on demand, so when it needs it, it kicks on, or it's always going to be on continuous. They also may have in the same device an, automa an automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator, or an AICD it's called. These are implanted in patients who have survived a cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation. These are attached directly to the heart. So patients should be treated like all their AMI patients. Treatment should include performing CPR, beginning compressions, use of AED, and the patient goes into cardiac arrest. The only difference is, is do not place a pad over these devices. Right? They're, they are there. The only way to deactivate those is putting a very strong magnet over the top of them to deactivate the defibrillator. We do not do that in the field. So the patient may have a malfunctioning defibrillator or they're continuously going into VTAC and the auto defibrillator keeps going off. Get them to the hospital. The other one is an external defibrillator vest, which is a vest which is built, um, built in monitoring electrodes and defibrillation pads. Um, they mon the monitor provides alerts and voice prompts when it recognizes a dangerous rhythm and before a shock is delivered. The vest should remain in place while CPR is being performed unless it interferes with compressions. Right. So to remove, remove the battery from the monitor, then remove the vest. Any patient who is wearing a device that has already delivered a shock should be transported to the hospital for further evaluation. Now, LVADs. They're more common than you think. There's different types of LVADs that are there depending on longevity of how long it's going to be in. Um, any patient that has an LVAD is supposed to notify the local fire department. You're supposed to have an idea of where these patients are located, what homes are actually there. So hopefully your departments have been notified if you have one in town. Um, let's see. So this enhances the pumping of the left ventricle in patients with severe heart failure. These are patients who are going to be getting a transplant at some point. There are several types of LVADs that are out there. The most common have an internal pump unit and external battery pack. A hum that um, a hum that indicates the device is working and troubleshoot equipment failure. All right. So the hum is good. You want to hear that humming sound inside. There's two different types that are out there. There's one called a non-pulsatile, okay, which have an impeller inside. And then they have a pump, which is um, what they call a pulsatile. So one of them, you'll actually feel a pulse, the other one, you will not. If the device has a display screen, look for an alarm code, right? Check the cable so everything is connected. Check the power supply. The patient should have extra batteries. Replace one of the batteries at a time. Please do not take them both out at the same time because then the machine stops. And call the manufacturer's 800 number for assistance. Right, supportive measures and transport all LVAD supplies to the hospital with the patient. There are not very many um, hospitals that are out there that can handle LVADs. So you may have to go transport to local. They may have to be flown um, or transported by ground to another facility um, that can handle that. Right. So I'm going to skip over the cardiac arrest section. Um, sorry, Mike, I just saw your message. We have another malfunction and we had to the shit and get. She said she only had 45 minutes until death. <laughs> yeah. Um, these patients, these patients need to be. Um, all right, Matt, no worries. These patients need to be um, taken seriously. Um, and a lot of these places are done in Boston. Um, Tufts Medical Center does a lot of these. So those arrange for transfer to get down or a flight. All right, so we're going to skip cardiac arrest as we'll be covering CPR. Uh, so we'll get through these slides here. ADs. All right. So how do we feel about cardiac arrest? Everybody pretty good with this? Do we need to go over that in depth at all? We are offering CPR, which will go more in depth on those. You guys are good with it? All right, perfect. 
<laughs> All right. So cardiac monitor, um, the EMS systems that you'll be working in allow you to do four lead and 12 lead. So white to the right, smoke over fire. So black being smoke, red being fire. Grass is always um, green under the clouds on the right hand side. However you want to remember it. Um, just remember that these all have a specific spot to go into. And we'll be covering that in the next presentation here. Uh, a 12 lead EKG, um, which we are, or most of us already know how to use this because it is within the scope of practice for both states, uh, other than Massachusetts, where it is not, I believe, it is not down there. Um, so you want to make sure you have direct contact and rub the electrode site with an alcohol swab prior to applying it to dry it out. Um, I'm trying to think of the other chemical that's out there you can utilize in drawing a blank. It's not betadine. It's um, why can't I think of it? It's another. It's a wipe that you can put down, and it makes it very sticky. We have them in our monitors up here, where I work. Benzoin. Benzoin. Thank you. That's it. I know it wasn't. <laughs> so we carry the benzoin ointment that you can put down after you shave the chest. And once it dries, it becomes very sticky, which works really well for your very diaphoretic patients. So to kind of explain the 12 lead now, all right, V1 through V6, the sternum here, fourth intercostal space to the right and left of the sternum is V1, V2. Then you find the fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line would be your V would be your V4. Then you go to V6 next, mid axillary line, fifth intercostal space, and then Three goes between two and four, and five goes between four and six. And you can make sure you take care of that. All right. It's 7.30, so let's go to the next presentation. I want to show you guys some rhythms. I'm not going to go in depth on 12 lead yet. We'll do that another day. Um, what I want to do is cover the basic arrhythmias and rhythms you're going to see that you can interpret um, with that. So stand by one second while I bring it up. So this is a program that I, I designed um, for some con ed classes, but I felt it'd be really good for EKG review and also to train new people on how to use it as well. All right, so let's get started with this one here. Like I said, I'm not gonna cover this in full, um, I want to cover the basic stuff first, and then another day um, we can kind of go more in depth on this stuff here. Because I'm actually starting to lose my voice a little bit more. So, all right, um, EKG review. Let's go over the basic arrhythmias: P, QRS, and T waves. We go through here, basic anatomy, which we're going to skip a lot of the anatomy, which we already covered. We're going to cover the basic arrhythmia content, um, which we will not be covering any kind of any atrial ventricular blocks or atrial and ventricular pacing. We, we can kind of see it, but we can't really go in depth on it today. Um, we'll pick another class to do that. So we already know about cardiac anatomy, right? We already covered this here. Atria, ventricle. Atria, ventricle, deoxygenated blood comes in here, oxygenated blood comes back out, goes round and round within the system. Let's get into the rhythms here, though. Remember that the sinoatrial node runs an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100. It travels through the internodal pathways to the AV node, which if this, this system fails, the backup generator kicks in. So 40 to 60 beats per minute, right? This travels then through the common bundle of hiss, right? 
down the right and left bundle branch block in the Purkinje fibers. If this system fails, the Purkinje fibers can take over, which will run an intrinsic rate of 15 to 30 beats per minute, right? Or 30 to 40, depending on which book you read. Um, when I made this presentation, this one here is 30 to 40 or less in the Purkinje system. These are your intrinsic rates or pacemakers of the heart, right? So let's break down the actual EKG, okay? No worries, Matt. No worries. All right. So let's talk about this one here. So let's break down the anatomy. We have a P wave, a PR interval, a QRS complex. So P wave first. From the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the Q wave is called a PR interval. All right. Then we have our Q wave, R wave, S wave. So QRS complex, we have the ST segment, okay, running from the end of the QRS to the beginning of the T, then our T wave, right, and then we start the next cardiac cycle. Each one of these is specific for numbers, okay? So our P waves have to be rounded in good morphology, all right? If they're not there and they're absent, it's a different type of rhythm, or if they're inverted. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. Our PR interval should be 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds across, which I'll show you guys here in a second. A lot of this may be confusing at first, but I will go over this with you guys in, in person as well on a real EKG strip on the next um, in-person day that we have. All right, the QRS complex should be less than 0.12 across. Anything wider than that is a wide complex, right? Our ST segment, or they call the um, or the QT interval, should be between 0.34 and 0.44 seconds across, um, which is a normal number. And then our ST segment is where we're going to see the ST elevation. So yeah, little lines exactly. So ST elevation, ST depression. And we're measuring that in millimeters, up and down, okay? So seconds go across, millimeters go up and down. We'll break that down even further to the different boxes, okay, in a few minutes. Um, with that being said, then we have our T wave. So now, built into this normal system, the P wave is atrial depolarization. So your atria is firing. The QRS complex is your ventricle depolarizing so when you feel that heartbeat and you feel your pulse that's this qrs complex that's a pulse all right inside of this ventricular depolarization your atria is repolarizing with electricity the t wave is your ventricle repolarization so it's repolarizing bringing more electricity back to that node to be able to fire appropriately this is where you get that heart sound, okay? Lub dub, lub dub. That's the sound that you're gonna be hearing. That's what they call an S1, S2 sound, all right? If I lose some of you, it's okay. This is extra stuff that I wanted to put towards this so you have an idea of what EKGs look like. Um, so we look at the negative or the mean electrical vector, right? Looking at a three lead or a four lead, right, negative versus positive electrodes. So current away from the electrode is below the isoelectric line. Current toward the electrode is above the isoelectric line. So when I go to the next one here, I'll show you that, all right? So on this slide here, lines of calibration, all right? If you look at these sections, anything below is a negative impulse. Anything above is a positive impulse. All right, so we use these um, lines to kind of measure in millivolts or, milli, or millivolts, which is 10 millimeter, all right, sections. So what is the approximate PR interval for this strip here? So we, I'm gonna go over that in a second. I'll show you guys in the next, next slide here, all right. Um, losing my voice here now. All right, so this is a better slide that kind of shows you more of the EKG or ECG measurements. 
So the PR interval should be between 0.12 and 0.20 seconds, okay? So we look at our different blocks. The greatest will go is 0.20 versus our um, PR interval, All right? So anything from side to side is seconds. Anything up and down is millimeters, okay? Each block represents one millimeter going up. So one, two, three, four, five millimeters. Every block to the side is point, um, point zero 0.04 seconds for every small block to every big block being point two zero. It makes more sense if you actually can see it on an actual EKG. So like I said, in the next um, practical day, I will literally draw this out for you on EKG strips. You can actually see it. It'll make a lot more sense. So as we're looking at this, can you guys see the dark lines around here, the big box? You guys see that okay? Okay. Each big box that you see here is 0 0.20 seconds and five millimeters. Okay, got that? 0 0.20 seconds, five millimeters. Every little box inside is 0.04 seconds. Every little box going up is one millimeter. So if I'm measuring the PR interval, I look from this box here where the arrow is, okay, to where the P wave starts, which is right about here. So that would be 0 0.20 seconds. That's how that works. All right. The other part you can do too is measure the actual rates. So we're going to just, um, the have, we're going to have to memorize the rate intervals. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40, 30, based on every heavy line, all right? So we start after, so pick a complex that falls in a heavy line, which is this one right here, okay? Then we're gonna estimate the rate by counting heavy boxes, all right? So rate, 300, 150, 100, 75. Right, so the next QRS complex that comes in will base your rate. So this will be about 75 beats a minute looking at these numbers. The best way to do this kind of stuff, honestly, is to practice it. Get an EKG strip, look at the boxes, write it down, then look online and try to find some stuff. I can also send you an email of EKG strips you can practice with as well with an answer key. Um, and they were pretty, pretty decent. So with that being said, our standard four lead, we will look at leads one, two, and three, AVR, AVL, and AVF, which are augmented leads. Um, so negative to positive, we look at V1, or sorry, not V1, lead one, right? Negative to positive shows a strip. There's a P wave, there's a QRS, and there's a T wave, which means this is a sinus rhythm. Looking at lead two, which runs a negative to positive. As you can see here, everything's upstroke, right? Negative to positive upstroke. So P wave, QRS, T wave. Lead three comes across negative to positive. And again, P wave, QRS, and we have a depressed T wave here, right? We'll talk about those later in another day. I just want to show you the basic basic rhythms. So looking at a standard three lead or four lead monitor, which gives us our augmented um, leads as well, does not show us the big picture. What kind of EKG actually shows us a bigger picture? The 12. This is why everybody should be getting 12 leads and not four leads, because 12 leads are more diagnostic. All right. So let's go over 
the 12 lead picture itself. When you put on a standard four lead, you'll see one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. That's all you're going to see on a standard four lead. When you do a 12, you actually get your vector leads, V1 through V6, which then will show you the big picture. And that's a picture you want to see. You want to look at the complete picture of what's going on inside the heart. So let's go over a couple basic arrhythmias, then we'll call it for a night, okay? So we're going to go over basic arrhythmias, normal sinus rhythm, sinus brady, sinus tack. Those are three that you can interpret in Maine and New Hampshire. So the initial approach, approach or analysis is done with four questions. One, what is the rate? Is it normal? Is it fast or is it slow? Right? What is considered tachycardia greater than what? What is considered tachycardia greater than what number? Yeah, greater than 100, okay? Anything greater than 100 is considered tachycardia. What about bradycardia? Anything, yeah, exactly, Kobe, anything less than 60. So anything less than 60 is brainy, anything greater than 100 is tacky. This is for the adult patient, okay? This is not pediatrics, all right? So the first question we ask, what is the rate? Is it normal? Is it Brady or is it tacky? Normal being between 60 and 100. Is the rhythm regular or irregular? Which means, is it is it firing at the same time throughout the rhythm? And I'll show you guys that in a second. And are there P waves? That first wave. Each P wave is related to a QRS with a one-to-one -one impulse conduction. So for every P wave, there has to be a QRS. For every QRS, there has to be a P wave. If not, then there's an irregularity. And the next question is, is the QRS complex normal or wide? Is it greater than 0.12 seconds? Is it wide, right? If it's wide, it's a, ventric it's a, tach it's a ventricular issue, like VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. Four questions, rate, rhythm, are there P waves? Is the QRS normal or wide? And the etiology behind arrhythmias is a disturbance in automaticity, like a pacemaker speeds up or a new, a new pacemaker takes over, or a disturbance in conduction, which is slowing or, a, or block in conduction of electrical impulse, or a combination of both, which we have reentry arrhythmias, right, which we'll talk about later. This is a normal sinus rhythm, right? So you can answer the questions, right? Is there a P wave for every QRS? Yes. P wave. QRS complex. The rate is between 60 and 100. This is a six second strip, so just count the QRSs and multiply by 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the heart rate is 70. Yep, exactly. Good job. All right. Is the rhythm regular? Is everything marching out appropriately by QRS? Is that march out correct? It's regular. All right. Is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Is anybody else paying attention? <laughs> Feel free to jump in. All right. So there's nothing we're going to do for this patient. This is a normal sinus rhythm. There is no therapy behind it. All right. This is okay. This is good. This is what we want to see. All right. Good. Now, sinus bradycardia. You kind of see in the picture as it flows through. All right. Count the, so the first one is the rate. What's our rate? Give me a number. 
how fast is it speeding now? Remember, these are six second strips multiplied by 10. All right, perfect. Rate of 40. Is it regular though? Is it regular? Yep, sure is. Right? Is there a P wave present? Okay, yep. Is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Yes, good. So really the treatment for this, we're treating an underlying cause. So give me some underlying causes of bradycardia. What could it be? Overdose, beta blockers. What else? Oh, yeah, shock. Or it could just be an SA node issue, right? Which would require the patient to receive different medications like atropine or pacing. So that could be electrical, electrical issue as well, exactly. So shock could cause this, lead end of shock, right? Beta blocker overdoses, things like that. Awesome, you guys are doing great. So let's talk about the next one, maybe. Oh boy. Let's go back a little bit here. That's better. Okay, we got it. So again, what's the rate of this one here? Yeah, hundred. Is there is the rhythm regular? Okay. Are there P waves? Perfect. Right. Is there a P wave for every QRS? Yep. And the therapy for this is underlying cause. What could cause tachycardia? Dehydration, drugs, shock, sepsis, MI, <laughs> all these different things could cause that. So the therapy would be treating it, which would be fluids, compensate exactly, Matt, compensated shock, <laughs> work. Yep. So these are all different things that it potentially could be. So let's do a self assessment. What is Rhythm A. Yep. Yep. Tack. Everybody else agree with Mike? Okay, good. About rhythm B. So borderline sinus Brady. Yeah, I would go with, you know, this, the, the presentation shows Brady as well, um, but it's borderline. It would be right around 60-ish. What about the last one, C? All right. There are some of you that I have not heard from, from a, in a while here. So can I get more participation from some of you guys? I can't see the strip. Like screen zoomed in. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to figure that one out. I'd love to see the strip and give you some input, though. <laughs> give me a minute. Let me see if I can figure it out. You know what? Right. <clears throat> Let me go over the next one here. So what is this 
here. Hey. Oh, there's no oh, call. There are only two strips up right now, Kevin, correct? Yeah, A and B. Okay, all right, I can see them now. Perfect, perfect, all right, all right. So the patient had no pulse, but still shows a rhythm. What could it potentially be? DEA. DEA, yeah. Yep. Which would be pulseless electrical activity. And this is a patient that requires CPR. When you put a patient on a four lead, you go to a patient unresponsive, and you check for a pulse, and you see this, and you feel no pulse, it's probably going to be PEA. Patients that are in PEA, based on our new protocols, is we work with cardiac arrest for an hour, 60 minutes, because they still have electrical activity. All right. What do you think the movie is? And then, all right, let's show a couple more of these and we'll stop. So some basic arrhythmias that you might come in contact with. There's one of them they call a premature atrial contraction, all right, which is called a PAC. As you can see where in the picture here, kind of where it fires from the opposite side of the heart. Um, what you're going to see is the rate is going to be a sinus in nature, but the rhythm is ir irregular which is interrupted by a PAC, or an incomplete compensatory pause. So you're counting these out. Everything's matching out perfectly fine, right? And then the fourth beat in is a PAC, which is a premature atrial contraction, looking like an extra beat inside of there, causing it to be irregular. And then it goes back to a sinus rhythm again. So the way I would document this would be a sinus rhythm with PACs. So this has a different morphology. As you can see, the P wave is different than the others. All right. The P to QRS is usually conducted with a normal QRS wave, so it's all the same. And we treat the underlying cause. And the thing is, a lot of patients that are in uh, PACs are asymptomatic, just transported to the hospital. There's nothing you're going to do in the field for it. All right. So let's go to the next one here. Um, this one here is atrial fibrillation. The rate is atrial in nature and cannot be measured because it just fires. As you can see, there's no um, absent P wave or what they call fibrillation waves in between. So the rhythm is a ventricular rate, which is variable. This is what we call irregularly irregular, right? So as you can see, the ventricle is just firing at its own rate that it wants to fire at, and it's very irregular in nature. There are no P waves, and we would call an F or fibrillation wave conduction is irregular because there's really no consistency in between this, right? So really the only difference is, is, is the patient symptomatic or not. Patients that are in AFib are most likely going to be, or will be on blood thinners. Um, usually I've seen like Xeralto or um, things like that and been on before. Um, another one that I just want to blame, Xeralto. Um, Eloquist. I've seen a lot of them on Eloquist as well. Uh, if it's very fast in nature, it would be like a rapid AFib with rapid ventricular response. These patients, yeah, I can. Um, in a second, Mike, I'll get to that too as well. Um, so, patients that have a rapid AFib or rates of like 140, 150 require paramedic care because they're going to either be cardioverted with electricity or they're going to receive a antiarrhythmic like deltaism or like a calcium channel blocker um, to slow down these rates. So Mike makes a good point. Explain the difference between irregular and regular for those who don't really know this. A, a regular rhythm, regularly regular, means that they have a P wave, QRS, and a T wave and it's firing at a normal rate, okay? There's no deviation. 
irregularly irregular patients, right, you're going to see that this is an irregular rhythm, right, because it has no P wave to Q or S to T, right, and the ventricle is not firing at a normal rate. This would make it irregularly irregular, right? So you're going to see these kind of things on on the EKG to be able to diagnose. Atrial fibrillation, though, for Maine and New Hampshire is not a diagnosable rhythm by the advanced EMD. But to have an idea of what it looks like, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. All right. The next one here is what they call atrial flutter. All right. So what you'll see is instead of P waves, you'll see um, what they call F waves, which are called flutter waves in here. So the QRS complex will fire normal. The drawback is you'll see what they have in here are flutter waves. Now, again, this is there's more to it than this. I just kind of want to do a quick overview of this one here. Um, the atrial rate may be 250 to 400 beats a minute. That's fast, right? But your perfusing, your perfusion, though, is your ventricular rate. So what we do, we look for this is, is a two to one AV block or a two to one AV, um, oh, I can't think of it anymore. Two to one atrial flutter, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, which means that you would have two F waves, one, two, to every QRS complex, All right? EKGs, honestly, are memorization, looking at them and memorizing them. And then from there, we learn treatments afterwards. But really, it's looking at something, memorizing what it is, and saying, this is it. And then we go into what's actually going on. Um, so the conduction regular is regular unless there's a variable block, right? And then we need to terminate the arrhythmia to, tr to treat the underlying cause. Again, nothing that you guys are going to have to work with, right? If you see atrial flutter and it's symptomatic, call for a medic. There's nothing you can do at all in the field. All right, this is what they call supraventricular tachycardia, um, like re-entry. And I'll show you guys this in the next slide here. But as you can see, it's, it's going to be going fast conduction, conju uh, connection between the atria and the ventricles, <coughs> which uses a <coughs> dual pathway with an AV node. As you can see, it's going around and around and around. And then there's an atopic atrial focus on top of this as well. That's atrial tach versus AV nodal. Reentry versus AV reentry tachycardia. Again, all things that are probably really confusing to most of you, but to have an idea of what it looks like. So what's happening here, let's go to the next slide. Right here is where I want to go there. So what will happen is, is you have a patient um, who has a heart rate, let's say almost 200, okay? So beating really fast, it's sinus in nature, but it's very fast, what they call supraventricular attack, so it's moving at a very fast rate. Um, these patients need to have a vagal maneuver or adenosine given. Um, again, all things that are not within your scope, but if you see a patient has a heart rate of 160 or higher, and it's sustained, and it's not traumatic in nature, presenting a shock, a paramedic is definitely required for these patients because they're in SVT, right? Um, so they have a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave, but the P waves are, are buried in the rhythm because it's going so fast, All right? Um, so looking at the self-assessment, again, I don't want to hit this stuff too hard and confuse anybody, so I'm kind of just going over this briefly, um, but having an understanding of rhythm you can and can't interpret. So if I were to say to you, what is rhythm A, what would you guys pick out of the two that we covered? Perfect, A flutter, exactly. What about rhythm B? A fib. Yeah, A fib, exactly. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's AFib. Don't look for a zebra. You're not going to find it. All right. So here's a clinical correlation. The patient is unresponsive and has a BP of 70 over 50. 
What's the rhythm? Narrow complex. Yeah, SVT. Okay. What are you going to do next? Hmm. Call for a medic. Medic, come, on, come help me out. Right? Perfect. Right? Medics are going to do synchronized cardioversion on that patient because they're unresponsive. Um, so here's the last one I want to show you guys. Okay. And it's more of the VTAC and VFib and assistly PEA stuff. So we're going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. Um, PVCs. Premature ventricular contraction. You're going to see these. Okay. That means that the ventricle, as you can see in the picture here, is firing prematurely, coming back towards the AV node. Okay. PVCs um, can be a different morphology. <clears throat> okay. They can be, which means it's firing from different parts of the heart. All right, what we call multifocal or unifocal. Unifocal being one point, multifocal being multiple. Um, so you may see different morphologies of a PVC. Ooh, excuse me. If you have two PVCs in a row, it's called a couplet. If you have three in a row, it's called a triplet. If you have four in a row, it's called runs of ETAC. That's bad, All right? Runs of ETAC patient may not be perfusing, therefore the heart is going to start getting more pissed off at you, potentially putting yourself into cardiac arrest. These patients need antiarrhythmics. All right, let me get to the next trip here. Like I said, I'll go more in depth with this stuff with you guys another day. I kind of wanted to cover these trips. So what you're seeing in these photos here, okay, the first one there you can see there's, there's multiple PVCs. How many do you see on that strip? On on the first one. How many PVCs do you see in strip one? Four. Four. Yep. Exactly. Four. Good job. Right? So we see our normal PQRS and T wave, right? You see the normal. And then you see that big wide complex one. And then again, wide complex. Matt, I think Matt Harrington, I think you were on a call with me and you say, I want to keep that strip, right? Because they were in by Gemini. I think that was you, right? Yeah. Okay. What you're seeing there is what they call by Gemini. By Gemini is a PVC every other beat. Normal beat, PVC. Normal beat, PVC. Normal beat, PVC. This is called by Gemini. Okay. If you had a normal beat, PVC, right? Every third beat, so beat, beat, PVC, beat, like that. That would be trigeminy. Get it? So try three. And quadrigeminy would be every four. Every fourth beat with a PVC. And that can happen. What could cause PVCs? What are your thoughts? What do you think it could be? What can cause a premature ventricular contraction? Right? Dehydration. What else? Yeah, too much caffeine, right? That can happen as well. Increased caffeine intake, um, dehydration, and things like that. I'm sure every one of you have been sitting here in a class or doing something and felt a thud in your chest at one point in time, maybe. Those are PVC, most likely the PVC if you're on that ACA. Now, the next one down, number two. Yeah, Matt says, yep, yep. Number two is a multifocal PVC because you can see the morphology from this one here to that one there are different. Right? So down here, sorry, my mistake. Down here. I want you to match them all. So number two, all right, is just unifocal PVCs. Number one being by Gemini, two being unifocal, so the PVCs look the same. Number three. It's going to be a multifocal because you can see the PVCs look different, right? Because they're firing from different points in the heart. So we have PVC, B, PVC, but they're different, multifocal, right? 
And this one here, you can see multiple PVPs coming into a row, couplets and triplets. This would be ventricular tachycardia. We're starting to see a, a pattern here. These patients down here are critical, number four. These patients need the yeah, dangerous, exactly. This eventually, these PVCs can stay in order and keep going and turn into this. VTAC. VTAC is a wide complex greater than 0 0.20 seconds, what they call monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, right? Where the atrial rate is normal. Um, P waves are present, but you can't, but they're obscured. Obscure. You can't see them. And, they're, and the PQRS is blocked by fusion complexes, a wide complex, right? These patients here can either have a pulse or they'll be pulseless, okay? If you see this on a cardiac monitor, and they have yeah, pads, exactly, pads. Um, if you see this on an EKG strip, call for a map, especially if they're awake. If they're dead, no pulses, start CPR and do your AED. This rhythm will pick up on an AED if it's with no pulse. All right. Let me go to the next one. So polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is torsades. What they call torsades de points or twisting of the point. Um, when you have a QT is prolonged. So what you'll see is you'll see a wide complex, bigger, you're getting smaller, and getting bigger again, you're getting smaller again. And what you're seeing in the picture here is the points of the Purkinje fibers down here are twisting, causing that polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And the only solution to fixing this, honestly, is getting a paramedic on board quickly, right? So you have to give a medication called magnesium sulfate for this. Right, and the last one I want to show you guys, um, last two or three, I should say, there's three more to go. Is this is V-fib? This is what they call coarse V-fib. Again, immediate shocks are needed for this for therapy. This is CPR patients. Um, coarse V-fib, obviously chaotic, unaccountable, um, absent, no abnormal, no, no, yeah, no normal QRS complex. The onset is abrupt and irregular. There's no PQRS at all, none. These patients need CPR and defib. All right, so you happen to see that one there. This is what they call fine VFib. This may also be a shockable rhythm as well uh, on the monitor. If you happen to go into manual mode instead of AED mode, then you can manually shock this patient in, in fine VFib. Same thing as course, so this is fine. Um, last one being a systole. So as you can see, the beats are starting. These are called agonal complexes. And it turns into basically a systole, which is no rhythm at all, all right? So they talk, I'm gonna take this out of there because atropine is no longer indicated for that anymore. Um, but CPR is needed. It's what they call the flat line. If you have a patient in cardiac arrest and they, don't, and they do not have... So Mike, I, have looked, I, I, I remember correctly, it used to be in Maine, you could do uh, manual defibrillation. New Hampshire is AED still, or as you say, AED mode in the cardiac monitor. Um, with a systole, compressions only, and this is where as the AEMT in New Hampshire, we can give cardiac epi, one to 10,000. Uh, same thing with VTAC and VFIP too, as long as they're in arrest. It's epi one to 10,000 every five minutes, or three to five. The other one would be pulse electrical activity. Um, so as you can see, there is no arterial pressure at all, but we have electrical activity. CPR, no defibrillation, um, uh, epi, one, 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 ten, one to 10,000 every five to three to five minutes, we just administer. All right, so doing a quick clinical assessment, what is A? Wide complex. VTAC. Yep. Yep. Ventricular tachycardia. Otherwise known as monomorphic because it's mono, same. Okay. What about B? Yep. 
sports odds exactly. It's odd the points. So you can see A, B, and C on here. You see how we see the twisting of the points is getting bigger, smaller, than really large again, and it's starting to shrink. That's twist odds. Right? You may pick up that as well. So you see this rhythm on the monitor while standing next to a patient. How many rhythms do you see, and what is your first action? This is it after this. <laughs> All for a bed, exactly. But what rhythms do you see on here? This is within your scope of practice. Is there a P wave for every QRS, and is there a T wave? Look at the rhythm. Is there a P wave for every QRS, and is there a T wave? Yes. Now, how about the very end? What do you see at the end of the strip? What does that look like at the end of the strip? It looks like VTAC. Uh, it's actually VFib. It's going to turn into VFib. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, but either way, either way. What are we going to do for that patient now when you see that happen? Generate a uh, run report for Kevin Romano. Yes. See, we got it. <laughs> um, I was going to say drink them, bless them, and BLS them, but you know. <laughs> so, Matt, Matt O'Connor is correct, and so is it Mike and, and Tondra. CPR and fast defibrillation. Right. A patient that's going into this usually show that they're going to be sick prior to. They're sick patients, right? So the pads should already be on. But if not, start CPR really quick. Do not do two minutes. Put pads on in shock right away. And then start your compressions, right? Early defibrillation saves lives. CPR prolongs it, but early defibrillation is what is needed, right? So if you have the patient on a monitor and they're in the back of your ambulance and you see the rhythm start changing, the patient doesn't look so hot. Throw some pads on really quick. If they go into VTAC or sorry, VFib and they go unconscious, right? Do a quick assessment, confirm, then light them up. Unsynchronized cardioversion. And a lot of times, if you recognize that fast, you might be able to put it back into a sinus rhythm again. That's why it's so important to pay attention to your monitor when you're in the back of the ambulance. Right. Kevin, if we get R on T and we that's just an immediate V fib, right? And we just go into shocking them. Right. So now you're talking about R and T stuff. Right. So you don't have to worry about R and T because we're not doing synchronized cardioversion and this patient's in V fib. You don't have to worry about the R and T stuff. They're in V fib. Right. The R and T stuff that you're talking about would be more indicative or well, you have to utilize R and T with synchronized cardioversion. For your rapid AFibs, your um, SVTs, those are the ones we're going to put sync to make sure you hit that RNT just directly on on those. All right? Yep. But so that's what they call synchronized cardiovert. When we're doing defibrillation, the other name for defibrillation is unsynchronized cardioversion, which means we're just going to push it and shock it. All right? And these are going to be done at a higher joule setting, okay? So for the AED mode, it's going to set it to where it needs to be. It's going to be a, right around, you know, 200 joules. What we have for cardiac monitors now are they called biphasic monitors. Um, it means that it comes from two points versus one. The old life packs back in the day and things like that, the old Zoll monitors were monophasic or mono, monophasic monitors, which means it was one shock with one joule setting delivered directly through the heart, 360 joules, boom, done. Versus a monophasic or a biphasic, which should be done on both ends. It doesn't take as much electricity and hits, them, and hits it at two points. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. All right. I don't want to go any more in detail than that, um, getting into blocks and all that, because I'm just going to confuse all of you that I, more than I already probably have. Um, I will cover this again 
in person with you guys, um, it definitely makes a difference to actually see it other than on a screen, but actually print it off. I have a rhythm generator that we can print off strips. And you can actually take them home, you can see them, you can look at them and all that. I will try to see if I can find, I have it somewhere on my computer. I will email out a bunch of different rhythm strips. You can look at them. But the only way to get good at rhythms, honestly, is is look at them, memorize them, and do the ones that you're trained and allowed to allowed to um, interpret. Don't get in the blocks. Don't get in the twelve lead interpretation. Sinus rhythm, sinus tack, sinus Brady, V tack, V fib, assistly. Those are your rhythms that you're allowed to interpret. Don't go any more than that. Once you've mastered those six, then if you want to learn more, you can. You just can't document it and you can't treat it. Awesome. Thanks, Mike, if you can do that. All right. That's all I can say about this. You don't want to get too in depth and learn all this stuff, the things you do not need to know yet. Get through your program, pass your A class, get your license, and then learn some more. All right. When you get into the medic school, you have to know everything that's on here. Let me just turn this off really quick.